Hello and welcome to Greenwood Park. We are a Christ-centered community changed by the power of grace. Our mission is to elevate God, embrace and share life, and engage this broken world. If you are visiting with us today, we would love to get the chance to know you. Please stop by the Welcome Center located out these doors after service. And now for some announcements. We are hosting a thank you luncheon for all the people who helped with Room in the Inn. It happens today, directly after worship, in the AP rooms. The t-shirts have arrived. If you place an order, you can go pick them up at the Welcome Center today. Camper applications are now available, and we are still taking staff applications too. And this year, you have the option to do it online. It's super duper easy. All you have to do is go to the website, scroll down to the camp logo, and you'll see two options to either fill out an application for the camper or fill out an application for staff. It's super easy. So fill those applications out and get them in ASAP. Hey Greenwood Park, I just wanted to remind you about the prayer conference April 20th. Um, Jesus said in his word that he, he wants his house to be a house of prayer for all peoples and all nations. Uh, and that's our goal here at Greenwood Park. Um, this prayer conference is for you, uh, whether you consider yourself a prayer warrior uh, or whether you're new to the faith or whether you are just trying to make prayer a more constant part of your life, this conference is for you. So uh, grab one of these uh, papers outside, sign up through the QR code, uh, and make sure you're there on April 20th. Thank you. Hey everyone, next Sunday, Hillview Church will be here to share lunch with us. We're so excited about that. If you don't mind, go ahead and sign up on the QR code. That will let us know how many people will be here. Also, if you purchased one of these t-shirts, we would invite you to wear that next Sunday. Also, this is really exciting that all the Grizzels are planning to be here next Sunday. So we're so excited that they will be here so that we can love on them and encourage them. Hey, all you young at hearts. The new date for the Yaw Banquet will be April 27th at 6 p.m. But instead of a banquet this year, we're going to be doing a fiesta. So we're going to have Mexican food and trivia. And so we're going to have Battle of the Generations trivia. And if you don't know what that means, I'll just explain it this way. If you are a part of the Yaws and you don't know who Taylor Swift's boyfriend is, you need to be studying. But if you are a part of the youth group and you don't know who Barney Fife is, you need to be studying. Hope to see y'all then. Hello, Greenwood Park family. This is Kerry Holden uh, with Dreamland Farms, and we're excited to invite the children's ministry out for an event at the farm. Uh, the, the farm is, is about 45 minutes away, uh, so be prepared for a bit of a drive. So before you leave the church, uh, Anna, Amanda has prepared some, some snacks for the drive, and make sure you use the restroom before, because uh, we don't want to have to stop on our way. We'll look forward to having you on April 28th. Good morning, church. Uh, as an ongoing practice, we try to keep everybody once a month up to date on how we are doing financially. Uh, for the month of March, we were about $9,000 under our goal for uh, budget for income contributions for March. This puts us at about $5,000 under for the year to date for the first three months of the year. However, we did, our, our spending has been, we've been uh, doing good on spending, we're actually about $5,000 under on spending for the year, so we're pretty well on track. Always can do better. Uh, just remember that all your contributions uh, fund all the ministries here at the church, uh, pantry, uh, everything, all the missionaries, uh, salaries and everything. So just a reminder how important it is to be sure to give each month and try to do better if you can. Um, just the ways to give is just a reminder we've got our boxes the black boxes around the church you can put checks or cash or whatever in the boxes you can give online and you can also see call or go by and see Catherine at the church office and she can set you up on a electronic draft remember to grab communion if you didn't get it on your way in this morning you can get it at any entrance to the auditorium or the two tables that are in the middle of the room we've been made aware that the QR code takes you to the resource page. We have now added a button to access the connection card. Please fill it out. That's all the announcements for today. Good morning, church. Um, last night I received a phone call uh, from Terry Lofton and uh, been asked to communicate to the church that Sue is uh, 
uh, in Vanderbilt Hospital and that um, she can't have any visitors or any phone calls at this time. Um, she's undergoing some tests and once they know more, uh, they'll communicate more. But uh, we just ask that you keep that family in your prayers along with a whole lot of other people um, that we need to be praying for. So uh, on behalf of the Lofton family and on behalf of others, let's go to God in prayer. Holy Father, we are indeed thankful and honored and privileged to be in your presence. We are blessed with a loving church here at Greenwood Park who care about each other, who not only care about each other as a person, but as a Christian, and we want to help each other get to heaven. Father, we pray, particularly for Sue Lofton, we pray that you would be with the doctors, the nurses, and all those that are around her, and that they will get great news today as they undergo a multitude of tests, and we pray that you would have Sue back here with us as soon as possible. Father, there are other people that are here that are hurting, um, and we want to ask you to be with them as well. I don't know the particular situation, but you do. And Father, I don't think there's a, a greater calling that we have as a Christian than to pray for each other. The prayer of a righteous man availeth much, and I think there's a lot of righteous people in this place striving to do your will. Be with us, be with Josh as he leads our service, be with Rubel as he directs the thoughts for the day, and we just pray that we will have kind hearts and attentive ears. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, if you'd like to turn to today's calling, it's Psalms 27, verse 1 through 4. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Who shall I fear? The Lord is the strength hold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will, be, who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. Let's stand and worship together. Be strong and courageous and do not be afraid. The Lord goes with you each and every day. He'll never forsake you. Thank you. 
Give me just a second. Josh asked me to do communion thoughts. I thought, great, got my props already here. I looked up there and said, where's the stone? He said, oh, it's on the other side of the wall over there. So anyway, the stone's been rolled away twice, I guess. <laughs> so almost as it had been seven years ago, 42 of us from here, mostly from here, went to Israel, Jerusalem, Golan Heights, the whole thing all around the Dead Sea. So we saw a lot of things then that I will never forget. And coincidentally, the stone was apparently rolled away in about 1870 when Jerusalem was pretty well destroyed and ransacked. So it wasn't there when we were there. But the place where the garden tomb was. The cross obviously was not still there, but the place where it was identified to be historically still was. And we went to tons of places that you can read about in the Bible. We went to the, the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan River and so many places that you can read about. The Jordan River is not nearly as big as I thought it would be. And back then I made several pictures of things that we saw. And it was just an amazing place that you could see the things that we read about. Tim's not here. He was going to be one of my other props because he and I were roommates for two weeks. And uh, I think he's almost emotionally over that. So we'll talk about that some other time. But what should we think about during this time? Obviously, the stone being rolled away and the cross, what should we not be thinking about during this time? The masters, TikTok, text, a lot of things can distract you during this time, and we gotta put all that stuff aside and focus on the things that are really important because that's appropriate, and of course, the sacrifice that all of us receive that are Christians is preeminent in this, the sacrifice that Christ made. And we went to the stone room where historically we're told Christ was kept the night before he was taken to be crucified. Very, very compelling place. It was chiseled out of stone, so it couldn't change a lot, even over 2,000 years. But the sacrifice that Christ made is preeminent. Also, the fact that the tomb, which we also went to the historic place of that, is empty. The stone was rolled away, and Christ didn't remain in that tomb. So, a lot of things that we should be thinking about this morning, and my challenge is wherever you go in your mind, for you to go to that place, and then we'll pray now for the bread. Father, we thank you so much that the cross is now empty and the stone has been rolled away and the tomb is empty and Christ is there with you. He is beseeching you for us. He is intervening on our behalf in our weakness and in the promises that he gives us to come to you ultimately. We want to thank you for that, for the sacrifice that the entire Trinity made in the path that was created then for us to come to you. And we thank you for this bread that represents this body. In his name we pray.
bottom, we also want to thank you for this cup that represents to us the blood that came down upon us from the sacrifice of your son, the blood that washes away your sins, the blood that helps us be cleansed and be yours. And we never want to minimize the importance of that and how tremendous blessing that it is for us to have the promise for you that we can be with you in eternity. Thank you, Jesus, for that sacrifice.
ready for them and prepared for them and here for them this morning. So uh, if you can take them out during this song, you step from the back and head down that way, and there will be some people out there to guide you. You're not sure where to go. Uh, and then just a reminder, pick them up and bring the last song and that's time. I'm sure they all look forward to every week to the time of I know they have a lot of fun for people in their work. So let's sing one more song before we was less this morning. I'll be back in just a few minutes. I'm going to go into the... I just didn't know if that was a precedent we should set that... Okay, never mind. A little in-house humor. I apologize for that. Couldn't resist it. I just have a mean streak. 
If you are a guest with us today, we're honored to have you. Thank you for being with us. Over the last few weeks, we have been reading um, an epistle written by the fisherman apostle. We have two letters in our New Testament that are called general epistles, open epistles to churches and Christians generally. And two of those, First and Second Peter, are written by that man who followed Jesus from his experience as a disciple of John the Baptist, looking for the Messiah. John saw him and said, there he is, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And on John's endorsement of Jesus, and then from his own time with Jesus, asking him questions, listening to him teach, seeing the miracles he performed. It was Peter who made the confession on behalf of the other 12. You're the Christ. You're the Son of the living God. The epistle that we're reading that he wrote in the 60s of the first century is not an evangelistic tract. It's not a like the Gospel of John, for example, where John at the end says, I've written these things so that you can believe that Jesus is the Christ and may have life in his name. Peter is now, as a Christ confessor and a leader in the early church, preparing his brothers and sisters for an impending time of persecution. And he's calling them to holiness against the fact that faith is beginning to be challenged. It is not yet a matter of Christians being imprisoned. <clears throat> it's not yet a matter of the empire setting itself against the church. That will happen not too far distant. But Peter in this letter is preparing his brothers and sisters who've made that same confession that he now has made we believe in this Jesus of Nazareth, that he's the Messiah, that he's more than the anointed one of God. He is, in fact, God among us. He is the Son of God, and we're committed to following him. But it was about to get difficult. So I'm going to preach the section of text that we're looking at today probably a little bit differently than the way you've heard it preached before. You may have heard this text preached as instructions for how Christian husbands, wives, children are to operate with each other in a family. That's not what's going on here. Um, we need to back the volume down a little bit. It's giving feedback, and that's going to bother. This is not the kind of instruction that's in Ephesians 5, for example. That's Paul telling Christian husbands and Christian wives and children in those Christian homes how they are to relate to one another. 1 Timothy 3 is mistakenly, 2 and 3 is mistakenly preached that way sometimes. <clears throat> 1 Peter is instructing Christians who live in households that are not Christian as to how they are to bear up under the special circumstances they're facing. And so, in this particular setting, we need to begin by understanding that, number one, this is not inspired instruction to a Christian man, a Christian woman, and their Christian or being nurtured to be Christian children. This is counsel to Christians living in homes where Christianity doesn't dominate, where the pater familias, that's the Roman term for the role, uh, the head of the household, the, the primary male, might be the grandfather, might be the father. He would run that house very much like a business or a corporation. And it wasn't mom, dad, and 2.5 children. A household in Roman terms Yes, it was the husband, wife, and children. But households in those days were small communities. 
Anyone who actually had a household probably owned several slaves. And so the interesting thing is the household instruction in this text begins by telling the slaves how to respond to the paterfamilias. And from that he'll talk about how a wife has to conduct herself in the context of a very patriarchal culture and a very patriarchal husband, father. He'll say a word, and if you'll notice, it's only a tiny little word to the men. He'll be exhorting the husband, the potter familius, the father, but it'll be on the assumption that probably most of the ones who will ever read this are not Christians. So it's going to make a difference in the way you read and hear the text. So families aren't here what you and I think of as the nuclear family. This is the paterfamilias. It is the wife. It is the children. It's a number of slaves. And if you had an estate, number of slaves might be 10, 20, up to... Cicero had over 500 slaves. All of them were his household. And a Roman household would not only include slaves, but people that you did trade with if your slaves were farmers or if they were people who kept animals and you sold animals. So the instruction here is a little bit hard for us to get our heads around because... This household, or what we're thinking of here as a family, is very different from what you and I think of as family. And that's the reason some of it reads a bit strangely. With that background that I hope helps rather than confuses, look at what Peter says first to the slaves. Not every Christian in the first century was a slave or somebody from the lower classes. By far, most of them were. In 1 Corinthians 1, Paul says, Not many of you Christians in Corinth are, are wealthy. Not many of you have power. Most of you, in fact, answer to other people. You're slaves. Something like 35 to 45 percent of the entire Roman Empire was made up of slaves. The Roman Empire, very much like our world has come to be, at least in the Western world, money was concentrated in the hands of a few. They didn't have a middle class. You were either among the elite and the land owning and the people who had a state, and, and if you had a state, you had to have slaves, or you were among the people who were slaves and lower tradesmen. So Peter begins his household instruction, his family instruction in what to us looks like a weird place. So beginning at verse 18, Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, they'd have been a minority, but also to those who are harsh. For it's commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they're conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. Slavery was just a fact of life in the Roman Empire. Moralists as significant in the Greek tradition who greatly informed the Roman practice as Plato and Aristotle... They said the fates have dictated where we live. And the fates have said that the majority of people are not intelligent enough to be leaders. And they'll have to be tradesmen. They'll have to be slaves. They'll have to be told by others what to do. And at a pragmatic level, people who were slaves were not people who were there because of race. We think of slavery and we think of British and American racial slavery. In the Roman Empire, color had nothing to do really with whether one was a slave, a freedman among the elite or the lower classes. For all practical purposes, you were a slave if you were defeated in the last war. And so if this city-state defeats this city-state, 
They take over your land and your property and your animals and your lives. And you are slaves to them until someone else conquers them or until there's a rebellion and you overthrow. Slavery had to do with power, not color. Slavery had to do with winning battles or being born to slave parents, not your intelligence. In fact, Aristotle was a slave at one point in his life because Athens had lost a war. One of the people that he as a slave tutored was the son of the victorious king Philip of Macedon. His name was Alexander. You probably know him as Alexander the Great. And Aristotle was his homeschool teacher, uh, was his tutor. And it was because of that that Alexander the Great set about this Hellenization process to make everybody learn the Greek language and live the Greek way. Okay, you say, I, I, I follow you, Rubel. I get all that. That's radically different from our culture, radically different from even the idea of slavery that we have given our American history. But here's the thing that vexes me. Why didn't Jesus, why didn't Peter, why didn't Paul initiate a rebellion to free the slaves and to be heroic to set them free from the chains and the persecution. The kind of persecution that would even Peter would say, sometimes, maybe most of the times, masters just think they need to give their slaves a good beating. Peter said, now if you've done something that deserves punishment, there's no spiritual virtue in that. But he said, you bear up under the pain of unjust suffering. And you're actually proving something about your character? Why didn't the Christians mount a slave revolt? Because that would have been the surest way to guarantee that there would be no church past the first century. The Romans were all powerful. The Romans had legions upon legions of soldiers. There were never more than 12 to 15 percent of the Roman population who were Christians, even in a nominal sense, until the fourth century. The surest way for the Christian movement to have been snuffed out would have been for it to become a social movement to free the slaves. Christianity took a different route. Christianity set about to overthrow slavery by teaching. Now, the first and great commandment is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But there's a second commandment that's like it. Love your neighbor. Love your fellow man. Love the other human beings in your world on the model of how you want to be loved if you're in that person's situation. And you have this beautiful little letter toward the end of your New Testament. It's tiny. It, it, it's not chapter 1, 2, 3. It's just, it's just one page. It's the little letter to Philemon. And Philemon is a Christian. And one of his slaves, one of how many we don't know, called Onesimus, somehow escaped. He ran away, and his slaves, when they ran away, typically would do, went to the largest congregation of people they could find, the biggest city that they could find, hoping to get lost in the masses. He'd gone to Rome. Paul was prisoner in Rome. And somehow Onesimus, because Paul had been in Philemon's house before, Somehow Onesimus heard about Paul or Paul heard about Onesimus and they connected. And Paul converted Onesimus to the faith. And this beautiful little letter of Philemon goes back to the slave owner in the hand of the runaway slave. Now what happens to a runaway slave? Nothing good. It's not just a beating, it's, it's maybe capital punishment. Paul writes a letter to Philemon, and do you remember what he says? Dear brother Philemon, 
calls his wife's name, refers to his son. He says, I've had occasion to run into Onesimus, and he's wronged you. But because now he's trying to follow Christ, he's trying to set his wrongs right, he's coming back to you with this letter from me in his hand. And when you read the letter, my dear brother Philemon, I want you to treat him the way you would treat me if I were walking into your house. Because Philemon, remember, you've said more than once that you owe me your life. And I'm sure he means by that not that he saved him from drowning, but Paul had taught him the gospel and had saved his spiritual life. So he said, I know he left as a slave and unprofitable to you, but Philemon... I'm asking you to receive him back as a brother. Now, that was not a violent revolution. And it didn't do away with slavery in a 10-year period. It was a nonviolent revolution that as the Christian message began to be preached, even though only a small number of people like Philemon were Christian slave owners who then started treating their slaves differently. But the whole idea of what human brotherhood meant... You see, human brotherhood was a foreign concept to the Greeks and to the Romans. They believed what I've already said about the fates. The fates make you part of the imperial family. The fates make you a senatorial person. The fates give you the opportunity to own land. The fates make you a slave. Christianity had said, the creative work of God makes all human beings, male and female even, children to God. That's so intuitive to us. What wasn't intuitive to the Greeks and Romans. Christianity began, and by the fourth century, when Christianity began to be institutionalized and, and by force of arms, a lot of people were forced to live by Christian standards they didn't even embrace. Christianity had begun to assuage and dismantle slavery and the notion of the brotherhood of man the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man began to change the culture. So no, Christianity didn't begin with a revolution to set the slaves free. Slaves were in an impossible situation. They could be beaten with no cause. They would have to serve the sexual pleasures of the master, male or female, on the whim of the owner. Because language of Aristotle, the great ethicist, slaves are but living tools. That probably helps you understand then why Peter immediately follows this matter about slaves enduring unjust treatment, slaves being beaten without cause, slaves being sexually abused, slave families being broken up, a member of the family and one of the children being sold off somewhere, with what looks like, well, this is sort of, of a parenthesis in here. It, it's hard to figure out what this means because after talking to slaves about how they just have to do the best they can with their impossible situation and accept the fact that you're going to suffer, he then says, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he didn't retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to the only person who judges correctly. He trusted himself to his father. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness by his wound, by his wounds. He's obviously echoing a Bible text that pagans wouldn't know, Isaiah 53, the suffering servant text. By his wounds you've been healed. You were like sheep going astray, but 
Now you've returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. This is not just a parenthesis. It's the justification for the slave being willing to suffer, suffer unjustly without sabotaging his master's food with poison or his fields by not planting good seed or not tending it properly. Peter says, and this is really, this is the beating heart of 1 Peter that we're looking at right now. 1 Peter 2 verses 21 to 25. Peter is preparing Christians for the fact you're about to suffer unjustly. You're about to be persecuted. You're followers of Jesus, so that shouldn't shock you. How did the unbelieving world treat the one that you have confessed as I have, Peter says, as the Messiah and the Son of God? They didn't give him justice. They didn't love him because he was on a rescue mission. They spit on him. They beat him unjustly. They drove nails in him and put him on a cross. Christianity was asking its earliest followers to put up with what they shouldn't have to put up with because they had no power to change the social environment. So slaves, you shouldn't have to be slaves. Slaves, I wish all of you were like Onesimus Philemon and instead of seeing master slave, in the words of Paul, saw brother, brother. But as long as things are as they are and they're going to be that way for the foreseeable future, probably through your whole lifetime, in the impossible situation you're in, Show your master that being a Christian hasn't made you a worse person. It's made you a better person. Show your master that following Jesus, who Tacitus, the Roman historian of the period, said is a new and deplorable superstition circulating among the Roman people. Show them that the word that's being circulated, the rumor that's being circulated that Christianity makes slaves a threat to their masters. Christianity turns slaves into people that talk about freedom all the time. We do, but it's freedom from sin, not freedom from our human cultures. We have to live with those and do the best we... We're learning that, aren't we? We live in a culture that's hostile to a lot of the things you and I believe. We live in a culture that not only allows, but normalizes things that most of us in this room count to be immoral and we don't want any part of. We don't want our children sucked into those things. We don't want our grandchildren learning that mindset and engaging in those behaviors. Whether it's drugs or illicit sex or shoplifting or... This isn't new, church. I've tried as we've been reading 1 Peter to say, historically this is what's going on, but doesn't it sound more and more familiar to the world we're living in? And because it does, I think 1 Peter is about as practical a part of the New Testament as you're going to find with regard to not how to win the world to Christ with an evangelistic strategy, but how to live as Christ's people in a world that's hostile to you. And then I'll show you in just a minute how that becomes within itself a sort of evangelistic strategy that's so subtle it probably has a better chance than buying a big tent and loud speakers and spending thousands of dollars on advertising to get people to come to an open lot with a big tent where 98% of the people who come are the members of the church already. Oh, but that takes us to the next move. And it's a continuation now of household, but you're not going to like this. Women and my wife did not like this section of text. 
until she discovered this is not what Christian wives are supposed to do in relation to Christian husbands. This is how Christian wives behave in a culture where they're in a compromised situation, not quite as, as impossible as a slave situation, but a woman's place in the first century world. Wasn't what your situation is, ladies, in your marriages, in your families, where you work outside the home, you can have your own income, probably most, most of you have a separate bank account for household expenses, this, that, and the other that you're taking care of. You're going to have your feelings hurt when I read it, but just bear with me and listen. Wives, in the same way, submit to your own husbands so that if any of them don't believe the word, they're not Christians. So they're not going to treat you in a Christian way. They're going to treat you, some of them, like you're a slave. <laughs> They have the right to beat their wives just as they have the right to beat their slaves. Women would have no legal recourse. Submit yourselves to your own husbands so that if any of them don't believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. Whoa! I said, this is not an evangelistic tract. It's not. But it does tell Christians, slaves, wives... If you're in a family situation where there's an unbeliever in charge, is the potter familius, he has absolute authority over you. The last thing you want to do is convince them that because you're a Christian, you're testy, you'll mouth back, you'll do things behind their back to sabotage their best interest, and they fear you lest you poison their food or bring a sharp object into the room and stab them. No. Women, and this is still true of women in many settings, your pay scale isn't what men get in a lot of professions and work settings. That's not fair. If you set the pay scale in your office, fix that. That's not fair. That's not just. But that's a minor, minor, minor thing compared to the situation these people were in. Wives, you're not quite slaves, but you're close to it. Your situation's compromised. Submit so that instead of thinking you're being a follower of Jesus has made his life harder, he's surprised that you're kinder than you've ever been that when he gets mouthy with you, you, you put up with stuff that before you didn't put up with. Even if he abuses you in some ways like you were a slave. They might be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty shouldn't come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles, the wearing of gold jewelry, fine clothes. By the way, if you've seen any of the busts of women from the Roman era of the two centuries before, two centuries after Christ, that, that's a constant feature. Huge hairstyles, braids of gold. Rather, your adornment, verse 4, should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle, quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. Time out. My wife would never call me Lord. I would say, but Abraham and Sarah, I would say that only in joking. Abraham came out of a pagan background and he abused his wife, not once but twice, giving her into a harem. She obeyed him. She submitted. In both cases, God protected her, brought calamity on, on the potentate who took her in and revealed to the potentate, Abraham has snookered you. 
Uh, that's not his sister. That's not a woman in his honor. That's his wife. Not every wife was going to get the kind of protection Sarah got. A lot of Christian wives in the Roman Empire were beaten. They were sexually abused. They were mistreated in horrible ways. Peter says, think back in the, in the Bible stories that, that you've begun to learn, and they didn't know many, by the way, because these were out of a pagan background. If there are any Old Testament Bible stories you've learned in Sunday school, ladies, it's that Abraham-Sarah thing. Now, it's not a pretty story. Abraham abused his wife. God protected her. You can pray for God to protect you. Perhaps he will intervene. Perhaps you'll suffer as slaves will suffer. And your consolation will be, but I submit myself to a God who judges justly. He's going to make this right at some point. Sarah obeyed Abraham, called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what's right and don't give way to fear. You see how this is a little bit different text than maybe you've heard it preached? It's not saying that we guys have the right to be abusive, that we have the right to be autocratic. We are not Roman husbands and fathers who are pater familias, who can mistreat our wives, boss them around, or even use the concept of headship improperly from the Bible to say, you have to defer to me in everything. When Paul is discussing how Christian husbands and wives relate to each other in Ephesians 5, where does he start? Verse 21, submit yourselves to one another because of your reverence to Christ. And however you understand male leadership in the church, male leadership in the home, it doesn't allow what Peter says, you women are suffering because you are in pagan households, you are being treated, mistreated by people who don't value Christ. But like slaves, the Christian message is not, we'll just revolt and we'll shed blood and we'll slit their throats. Just like Sarah suffered at the hands of Abraham, some of you will suffer from a paternalistic culture, culture, a misogynistic culture. Do as much as you can to accommodate quietly, loving, reverently, gently, and let your husband see the fact that you're a Christian doesn't make you a bad wife. It makes you a good person and the kind of wife he always wished he could have had. And so at the end, there's only one verse to men. Yeah, we don't need much instruction, right? Yeah, yeah I got, I get, I'm getting amens now. Well, that's actually not the way it works. There's only one verse to men because, number one, it's not very likely that 2% of the people who are hearing this letter read aloud in their churches, they are potter familias in their families. Remember? Slaves, tradesmen, lower classes, women and children. Paul said they're the natural ones, the ones who feel the boot of oppression, who gravitate to this message of Christ setting them free from sin. Husbands, you who have every advantage in your household, if you do happen to be a Christian, or even if, if you're, for whatever reason, reading this and you're not a Christian and you're confused that I'm telling your slaves to be better, your wives to be more gentle and submissive, and husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. And I immediately go to the next slide. What's this weaker partner business, bub? <clears throat> the word translated partner here, skewos, 
is a word that doesn't mean weaker sex or even weaker in the partnership. It just means physically weaker. It's the same word Paul uses in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 4, to talk about possessing your, King James Version says, instrument or vessel, I forget which one, and I be your body. It's the word for your body. Physically, you're not in a position to fight back. There might be an occasional exception to that. But typically, women in terms of social, cultural power, and even physical strength, those of you husbands who are potter familias, show some compassion in realizing that your slaves have no rights, your wives are at a disadvantage to you. Please consider, and certainly if you're a Christian, be considerate and treat especially your wives with consideration as that they have no power to stand against you or hurt you. But notice, he immediately, so that you don't take this weaker partner, some translations even say weaker sex, that's a terrible translation, so that you don't hear it that way, look at the affirmation that comes, they're heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. If you are a Christian man, a Christian husband, a Christian potter familius, not only do you not show disrespect and abuse toward your wife, you realize that in the Christian system, she's a joint heir with you of the life that Christ is trying to breathe into your life and relationship. This is a hard text. I've tried to walk through it slowly. It's a hard text because it's been mispreached. This is the model for a Christian male. No, it isn't. This is counsel to Christians who are living in situations of oppression. How do you deal with it? How do you deal with it in your office? How do you deal with it in your company? Some of you who are men as well as... Well, I have to put up with a lot of things. Bingo! Now you've got Peter's point. Peter says, we're not living in a world that is heaven come down. We're living in a fallen world. And where you work, in the neighborhood where you live, in the fourth grade, in the ninth grade, at Western Kentucky University, at any university you go to, a lot of things are going to happen in the majority culture that grate your soul. You say, I, I don't want to be left out of everything, but I know I'm not supposed to be a part of that. Yeah, I get that. I'm having to take abuse because I, I, I go to church instead of partying on the weekend with my friends. I have to take abuse because I've still got a Bible in my room. I pray. I sometimes explain to my roommate or my best friend or my girlfriend, no, I, I, I really don't want to. Well, maybe I want to, but I, I, I can't because I hope you don't say I'm a member of the church. That, that's, that's too weak an answer. I'm trying to follow Jesus, and I don't think that would be part of his experience. Christian family life is so different from living as a non-Christian in a culture generally that's non-Christian, and certainly as Peter is envisioning, in a household where the leadership of that is under a man who's potter familius, but he's not a Christian. But the very things that I've talked about today, like that Philemon Onesimus story, which I, I think it's a beautiful letter because it's such an exception to the time and place. Christian family life began to be altered by these Christian teachings so that without the word, a lot of people said, maybe I should give more attention to Christianity than I have. Now, of course, certainly you have to have the word ultimately to become a Christian. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But Christian behavior opens up people to listen to that word. This is a quotation from a book by Tom Holland, I close with it. Holland is an atheist. In his book, Dominion, 
subtitle, How the Christian Revolution Remade the World. And Holland's thesis as an atheist is, you know, I've faulted Christianity that Jesus and Peter and Paul didn't say, well, slavery is wrong. Why don't we step up and do it? Why didn't they do the Martin Luther King in there? He said, it dawns on me Martin Luther King could do it in his day because people had Bibles and people generally knew what it would be to quote Jesus about loving your neighbor as yourself. He said the Greeks and the Romans had no such background. Here's what he does say. Here in this sacral understand the view of marriage that, that Christianity promotes, not where there's an iron-fisted paterfamilias who rules and beats and abuses. Here in this sacral understanding of marriage was another marker of the revolution that Christianity had brought to the erotic. The insistence of Scripture that a man and a woman, whenever they took to the marital bed, were joined as Christ and His church were joined, becoming one flesh, gave to both a rare dignity. If the wife was instructed to submit to her husband, then so equally was the husband instructed, be faithful to your wife. You see, everything about Christianity and the basic ethical teaching that it gave that began to seep out of the church into the culture has made things better. You and I are heirs to the better part, but there's still a lot of culture that's like Roman culture was in that time and place. We're still living in a fallen world. Until Jesus comes back, there will be abuses of men in some situations, of women in more situations, of children. There will be abuse, abuses of employees by employers. There will be abuses of citizens by government. The Christian response is not to take over government by some sort of nationalistic fervor that we foster through the churches. That's being heavily promoted. The Christian answer is so that without a word because the church, because the people of God accommodate as best they can to a fallen world and a culture that's hostile to them to model something radically different so that we forgive stuff that nobody should have to forget. I know nobody should have to. We do it voluntarily because that's the way Jesus has treated us. He shouldn't have forgiven us. He shouldn't have had to go to a cross. He shouldn't have had to suffer. A lady recently said to me, you know, I think sometimes about the things that we Christians have to put up with and how galling it is. But then I remember what Christ suffered for me and I sort of get over my snit. I don't know if you know the word snit. It's a bit of a technical term. So... Be careful. The Christian faith is not a political faith to go pack a court, elect these people, join this party. Christian faith is apolitical in that regard. Christian faith is not even the means to fixing everything that's wrong in families. The Christian faith fixes individuals. The Christian faith saves us one at a time and places us in a community like the Greenwood Park Church to keep reminding each other, yeah, a lot of things happen around us that we don't like. A lot of things happen around us that put us at a disadvantage. A lot of things happen to us that are unfair. We're actually in much better shape than Christ and the earliest Christ followers were. We've got to stay about the task that Jesus suffered for us, and we'll sometimes have to suffer some slights and injuries and insults in the seventh grade from the neighbor in the workplace. We turn the other cheek. We love the person who's been unloving. We forgive and don't get even. That sounds like a message that most of us don't want to hear. What we want to hear is, here's how you fix it in an instant, and here's how you turn the tables on your enemy. People, that's not Jesus. 
that's not the Christian faith. So what is the call? Our call is to imitate Jesus. Praise team, come on up. We're ready to sing. Is to imitate Jesus in the one thing that is so confusing to the world when the culture that they're creating is so unnerving and hostile to us. We're trying to follow the model of loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength to stay faithful to what we've been called to and what we profess belief in when we are doing a church assembly. And we do it for the sake of the second commandment, which is to say, yeah, we're uncomfortable with it, but we're not mad at you and we're not going to try to get even with you. In fact, is there anything I can do to help you? Is there anything I can do to show the sort of kindness in turning the other cheek toward you? We probably won't say that out loud because that would infuriate them. But that's what we're thinking. You find some way to return a kindness for every insult. You find a way to forgive even when they've never asked and won't for you to forgive it. This is the hardest text in 1 Peter right here. Number one, because it's been preached wrong so often that this is the model for way Christian. This is not the model for Christian families. This is the model for how a Christian household lives in a hostile culture. And it's hard because it asks us to do what I don't want to do. I don't want to take an insult without having one just as sharp to give back. I, I don't want to be mistreated without recourse. I want to be able to get in a work. Peter says, Jesus suffered for you. Don't be surprised. You're going to have to take a blow or two on the chin for his sake. React the way he did. And you just might, without the word, without getting in the last word or without them listening to your sermon, you might be able to get their attention to say, there's something going on there that, though it confuses me, I think I'd like a piece of that action. What's going on is what we're going to sing about. Let's stand and sing as we close.
Let's pray. God, we thank you for reminding us today that we are to be a Christian counterculture, to be set apart from this world uh, for the things that you have purposed for us. We pray that you'll help us to die to sin and to live in righteousness because we know by the wounds of Christ that we have been healed. And we ask that your spirit dwell in us mightily uh, to be your hands and your mouth and your feet, your arms to the world. We pray that you'll empower us and strengthen us to live for you. And as your people, we ask that you put your name on us through this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord make his face turn toward you and give you peace.